Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Sheriffs in Louisiana have seen this as, a, as in, in some cases, a very lucrative opportunity. Prisoners for Profit, Louisiana's role in the controversial immigration issue. Nobody wants these little bitty crawfish anymore. Looks like plenty of crawfish and a busy season, but is there a catch? We're just not accepting a password and you don't just go log in to some random place. The work to keep our computers from being hacked. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, a Louisiana judge resigned Thursday after several people, including the governor, called for her to step down. This after it came to light that State District Judge Jesse LeBlanc used racially charged language in a text message with a former Assumption Parish Chief Deputy as the two were ending their extramarital affair. Now a look at some other news making headlines across Louisiana. Ralph Abraham won't seek re-election in the fall, keeping a pledge he made to serve just three terms. Abraham is the Alto Republican who represents the 5th Congressional District. Monroe and Alexandria are its population hubs. He says President Donald Trump asked him to reconsider and run again, but the congressman insists on keeping his pledge. He is just months removed from an unsuccessful run for governor. The governor plans an expansion of coastal restoration and flood protection efforts that for the first time will target greenhouse gas emissions by state industry as a way to reduce future sea level rise. Edwards says science tells us that rising sea levels will become the biggest challenge we face, threatening our best efforts to protect and restore our coast. The large model of the Lower Mississippi River at LSU's Center for River Studies will join museums taking part in First Free Sunday. Beginning Sunday, March 1st and the first Sunday of each month, many capital city museums are open admission-free to visitors. Congressman Garrett Graves is co-sponsoring a measure to eradicate nutria. The invasive swamp rat native to South America came to Louisiana in the early 20th century. California is another state fighting the animal. The measure would make $12 million available each year until 2025. Nutria eat at tree roots, causing erosion. The American Queen Steamboat Company says its newest cruise paddle wheeler has passed its second sea trial and will make its first cruise in April from New Orleans to Memphis. The 245-passenger American Countess went through the Intracoastal Canal from Homa to Morgan City as part of its trial. It is 318 feet long and is being readied in the Big Easy for the cruise. And just happening, LSU's Board of Supervisors announcing they will hire a consulting firm to make recommendations about the university's administrative structure. This includes possibly separating the president and chancellor's position on the Baton Rouge campus. The positions merged back in 2012. Also, the State Board of Regents this week rejected the idea of establishing a new law school in northwest Louisiana. Two state lawmakers had asked for a feasibility study, but the study found little compelling evidence for a law school in Shreve. Port Bossier. Eight of the 51,000 asylum seekers currently jailed in the U.S. are incarcerated right here in the Bayou State. The so-called prisoners for profit controversy is the center of an ongoing PBS investigation. We sat down with a local reporter with the advocate who worked with the network 
on those reports. Their investigation took them to facilities like this one, far from a major city, well off the beaten path. This is Pine Prairie, Louisiana. The fences here covered with razor wire surround what has become a detention center for migrants stopped at America's borders. Just in the last 18 months to two years, a massive influx of uh, federal immigration detainees to Louisiana. So, you know, as of 2016, when President Trump was elected, there were maybe 2,000 um, immigrant detainees being held, uh, mostly at two federal prison complexes uh, in, in, in Pine Prairie and uh, in Gina. Um, and since then, um, we have very rapidly increased the number of people being held in Louisiana. It's now over 8,000. Bren Stoll of the New Orleans Advocate has been writing stories about the Louisiana prison system for several years. He partnered with PBS to investigate prisoners for profit. There's been this massive demand for, for detention space, and so sheriffs in Louisiana have seen this as, a, as in, in some cases, a very lucrative opportunity. So for years, the state pays the relatively meager rate of about $25 per inmate per day to sheriffs to, to house them. And uh, ICE's rates vary by facility, but in, in most are, are at least twice that, often three times as much money. Stoll says the jails and prisons in mostly rural parts of central and northern Louisiana were empty as a result of the state's criminal justice overhaul, an effort to reduce prison populations and save millions of dollars. Those beds, though, are no longer empty. Many are now filled with immigrants. They basically are being able to fund their jails keep their staff and create jobs in many instances because you have to hire more people because you have more inmates now or more detainees. So they see it as a win-win, but there's a downside. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, anything having to do with immigration policy is, is extremely controversial. Um, a lot of the vast majority of people being held in Louisiana are asylum seekers. So they're people who are fleeing um, oppression in their home countries. Could some of these detainees spend years waiting to get their case through the backlog uh, that has become a part of the ICE immigration issues that we have here in the United States? Six months, nine months at least. Uh, for the vast majority of folks in the system. Um, there, there are cases where people have spent literally years, uh, especially if you have a particularly complex case. ICE detainees held in rural areas are usually far from legal assistance and must rely on attorneys like Amario Lopez, whose nonprofit organization, Immigration Services, offers them free legal representation. But he lives in New Orleans, and as we learned from the News Hour report, must drive three to four hours just to meet with his clients or attend court appearances. And those needing his help often have language barriers and very complicated cases. These are folks who have passed uh, what's called a credible fear interview. So if you arrive in the U.S. and you claim asylum, you have to sit down and, and, and give an in, be interviewed by federal immigration authorities who determine whether or not you have a credible fear of being sent back to your country, which is that whether or not your, your claim you know, merits further examination by the courts. And they've been found to have that. And then they're sent to, essentially sent to prison. Stoll says there's a good reason why so many immigrants have ended up here and why local authorities who run the prisons are able to pay the private prison companies like LaSalle, Geo, and Core Civic, and still make a profit helping many of those communities stay afloat. Three primary reasons. Um, one, I mean, Louisiana has long been uh, a leader in incarceration. We are uh, Louisiana is incarceration incorporated. It's, it's got a large prison system, um, including a large locally run, non-state run prison system. And um, in, in a lot of local communities who have built their, their economies around jails. And then the other thing is, is the cost in Louisiana is much lower to the federal government. So uh, on, on average, ICE pays, I think, per detainee per day, about 120 something dollars in California. In Louisiana, it's 60-something. So they're paying about half as much. For ICE, this is, it's a bargain. This is one of the cheapest places in the country to lock folks up. The third reason is it happens to be relatively close to, uh, to Texas. Uh, it's not an incredibly long trip uh, from the border. So 
as a you know compared to trying to bus folks to say North Dakota or something like that. It's it's a much shorter trip here. He says the Bayou State also has some programs already in place, making our state more attractive. There's immigration courts in central Louisiana uh, that have been there for quite some time, and the Alexandria Airport has for years been uh, a, a hub for what's called ICE Air, which is ICE's uh, the airline, the deportation airline that's run by the federal government. Um, so you put all those factors together and Louisiana is a very appealing place for the government to, um, to build a large immigration detention network. The PBS NewsHour will air another segment of their Prisoners for Profit investigation next month. We'll keep you posted. Well, all the signs have been pointing to this crawfish season as being robust. And with Lent underway, people are buying crawfish in big numbers. But what are the experts saying? We went to some to find out. Okay, right now they're coming out of a soaking pot. They already been processed, washed, clean, boiled. Bill Pizzolatto watches carefully as this batch of crawfish makes its way along the preparation line at Tony's Seafood in Baton Rouge. So it's ready to peel and ready to eat. Good seasoning, very good. Tony's has grown into one of the largest seafood markets in the Gulf South. It began as a small family produce store 61 years ago on Plank Road in Baton Rouge. Pizzolatto is co-owner. Crawfish Charles is families get together in the backyard. The year this year started off, it's got a lot of crawfish. The, the struggle is trying to get the right quality and the size. Uh, they got a lot of crawfish, but there's a lot of small stuff that we turn down, but we try to keep the quality up as best as you can. Now all we need is about maybe eight or ten days of sunshine and for that water to warm up, and we think it's going to be a nice crop out there for the people. While a business like Tony's is giant, L.A. Boilers in Baton Rouge is smaller in scale, but proof that demand for crawfish and other seafood is just as high. On weekdays we'd sell maybe about 20 sacks, but on weekend days we'll sell anywhere between like 50 and 70 uh, a day. Um, and that includes live and boiled. So this is the average size of our crawfish. Um, we haven't been really getting any much smaller than this. They've all been around this average size uh, right here. Um, even occasionally some have been, you know, a little bigger. Uh, we're not really getting too many small sacks in at the moment. All of that is great news for crawfish lovers. Hungry for a strong season after the last two were below average. Media reports jumped all over this year's forecast, with a headline from the Shreveport Times beaming, crawfish season off to hot start. I'm, I'm one of those uh, damn Yankees that came and stayed. Professor Greg Lutz is an aquaculture specialist with LSU. He is one of America's foremost authorities on crawfish. The little creatures have fascinated him his entire life. My dad, would take me out fishing on the river in Dayton, Ohio when I was a little boy, and I would pick up rocks and catch crawdads. We called them crawdads. By the time I graduated college, the only thing I knew I was interested in was crawfish, so I came to Louisiana. When I called you, all I had seen was reports that prices are half of, of what they were last year. Uh, the supply was two to three times more than it was last year. Mm -hmm. So I came to you with that information and uh, you said, yes, but. So this year, everything went great. You know, everything, good survival, lots of reproduction, but suddenly you've got a lot of crawfish in that pond and only so much natural food for them to eat. So with all the makings of a banner season, Lutz says there is a dose of sobering reality. And research has shown us over and over, not just one study, a number of studies, that if you've got a lot of crawfish out there per square meter, you can flush fresh water every day. You can throw expensive shrimp food out there. You can play music for them every evening. It doesn't matter what you do, they're not gonna get very big. They just will not, they, they are just cued into all sorts of natural triggers that say, hey, you know, we're really crowded. My best strategy is to stop growing as soon as I can. 
Lutz says when a farmer has a lot of crawfish crowding his ponds, he's got to work hard to try and thin them out to make the most of the resources he has. That from a producer's standpoint, having so many is not always a good thing. Over the last decade, maybe 20 years, our, our consumers have gotten pretty spoiled. Nobody, nobody wants these little bitty crawfish anymore. Louisiana dominates the crawfish industry. The Promotion and Research Board says we produce up to 95% of the crop. This year we're pushing 250,000 acres of crawfish production. The value of our crop is probably going to be close to 200 million. But Lutz believes that number would be much higher if a peeling machine, designs of which are in the works, was developed. Our Crawfish Promotion and Research Board is really trying to foster the commercial development of a peeling machine. Every year, millions and millions and millions of pounds of crawfish go unharvested because by the time we're later in the season, the consumer wants that medium to large animal and we've got a lot of small animals and they can't all be processed the way we peel crawfish now. So if we had a machine that could do that the way they do in shrimp, suddenly our industry might be worth twice as much as it is right now. The commercial sale of crawfish in Louisiana dates back to the late 1800s. But Pizzolatto says a huge shift happened in the 1970s when controlled crops began. Probably the latter part of the 70s, you started seeing farm raise, raising rice fields. And now it's really done change over because you can control the crops. So a lot of the crawfish coming out today is mostly rice field crawfish because you can depend on that crop. Whereas a wild crawfish, if the water's too high or it's too low, is very unpredictable. I mean, like right now, a few weeks back, we was getting a few wild crawfish. Now it done stopped. The water done got high in the, in the river, in the spillway, and it done slowed down the catch. The water's cold. So we just need some warm weather and the water in the spillway to get right. Then you can have the pond crawfish as well as the wild crawfish. Now to track the best prices, there is an app for that. Just download the Crawfish app Check it out. It's a free download to your phone. Just within the last three months, hackers shut down government computers in New Orleans, the Sheriff's Office in Rapides Parish, and St. Landry Parish Schools. Now this follows major breaches of five Louisiana school districts over the summer and a state agency attack that affected 10% of the state's 5,000 servers. This month's Louisiana Public Square brings together cybersecurity experts from government, industry, and the military to explore how to protect the state's virtual infrastructure and what it's going to do to close the cybersecurity workforce gap. We're constantly evolving our protections, and nothing is ever 100%, even if I get to 99.9999, what happens to that one fraction of a percent that's left. So we stage our protections to prevention, preventing people from accessing our system, to protection. If they get in our system, we encrypt your data to once they get to it, they can do nothing with it, to mitigation, in a case of ransomware, if they prevent us from getting to our data, we can restore and recover that because we have multiple copies in safe places where we can ensure data integrity. All of us security firms have tools that can protect credentials through identity protection. We can protect um, password reuse. We can do these to have these tools out there, but you need the people to institute them and you need the willingness to make sure they are instituted fully. A lot of us will get them, a lot of things we see is they get them started, they get them three-fourths of the way there, call it a success and move on and don't look at it again. Everything you have has to stay up to date. Everything, you know, has to be, all your vulnerabilities has to be fixed in, in a timely fashion. So as you buy these tools, as you institute these tools, you have to make sure you have people using these tools and making sure they are fully functioning and, and working. With the major presidential election coming up in November of 2020, what precautions are being taken to ensure that hacking will not interfere with results of the elections? I'll try to field some of that. The, uh, the individual state's secretary of state 
are responsible for those election results. And different states address election security in different manners because of the way they distribute the voting. But within our state, there's a tremendous amount of work being done currently to uh, prepare ourselves for uh, dealing with antiquated machines. There's some lease initiatives that are underway to get uh, new equipment in place that is more robust and more sound um, in advance of our, our purchase of some new equipment. But all secretaries of state are dealing with this issue similarly but different across the nation. It's interesting to see that, that they're, they're not looking for security owners because those things talk amongst each other and you don't realize they're, they're communicating with one another in your home. If you have light, uh, smart light bulbs, smart refrigerators, smart water faucets, smart, um, smart cars now, you think of the Teslas and everything, system, your whole yeah. security system, your ring security system. And there's people out there on dark, just selling ways to get into those devices. The, the, the ring hack, it was, came out, there was a, a forum kind of walked people through exactly how to do those, these things. And, most, and some of it's kids uh, that are playing around, want to play jokes on their friends, but I mean, to me it's, a, it's creepy people that are in there spying on and it's sick, sick individuals, to be honest with you. Um, but, and Craig mentioned this earlier, we're trumping uh, convenience for security. We're not looking out for how to secure these things. And the general user really don't understand how to secure these devices once they get them in their home. Hack will re-air tonight at 8 on LPB. You can view additional sound bites on this month's web page at lpb.org slash public square. Of course, each year, hundreds of thousands of people gather in New Orleans and all over the state for Mardi Gras celebrations to watch the parades and gather beads, lots of plastic beads. And as fun as it may be, more and more people are seeing and learning about how much trash is produced, and some groups are taking a stand to make Mardi Gras a little greener. Emma Reed brings us this report. So we're out here for the third year doing our On the Route Parade Recycling Program. And this is an initiative that we started to help lower the environmental impact of Mardi Gras. So what we do is we help the public recycle throws that they don't want. That means stuff that they catch from the floats, beads, toys, cups, that sort of thing, as well as disposable recyclable waste like aluminum cans and plastic bottles. These beads are imported from overseas. It's disposable plastic. And over the years, the amount of stuff being thrown and then left on the street unwanted has really, really grown exponentially. So it's a program that a lot of people in this community feel like they need because it actually helps beautify our streets and then helps protect the storm drains, which are our first line of defense. So about Three years ago in 2018, they opened up five blocks of the storm drain system on the parade route and found 46 tons of beads laying in the sewer, obstructing the, the flow of water to the pumps that take it out of the city. So this is an initiative that is not only about environmental causes, but also about saving the city money and then protecting the city against flooding. There has been studies that have been done that talk about the toxicity of beads and it, it's really quite disturbing. A lot of the stuff that, that we use and throw here actually isn't legal in other states because of the level of contaminants in it. Thank you so much. Here you go. So make sure you leave it by the curb at the end of the last day parade. We'll come by and get it. So what we've done is gone out this morning before the first day parade and we've passed out, I don't know, maybe 4,000 bags to the public that was waiting for the parades to start and we gave them instructions on what the bags were for, asked them if they wanted to help us recycle today, and they're gonna fill those bags full of stuff. And right now we're waiting for the last parade to roll and we're gonna follow it with two trucks and pick those bags up off the street with a group full of volunteers. So this initiative, uh, the parade throw part of it, helps benefit the Ark of Greater New Orleans, which is a fantastic nonprofit that benefits people with intellectual disabilities. It actually provides wage earning jobs for them by a Mardi Gras recycle center where they take in the beads year round through donations and they sort them, repackage them and then sell them to riders the following year. And it's a fantastic initiative because it helps keep beads off the street, out of the storm drains, and then helps provide wage earning jobs for people in our community. 
So this being our third year conducting the program, we've seen the response grow very, very quickly within, within just the last few years. When we go out and pass these bags, the public actually knows what they're for now. They've seen us before and they want to take a bag. They say, yeah, I know exactly what that's for. I'm going to take it hanging up on my ladder. They know who the nonprofits are that benefit from this. And so it's something that has really, really helped engage them and something that they're happy to help do. All right, Natasha, some numbers are just in. And mm -hmm. in two parades this year, Grounds Crew and ARC collected almost 6,900 pounds of beads Incredible. and 8,000 aluminum <laughs> cans and plastic bottles. What an awesome job. And yeah. next year, look out for those purple bags and fill them up for a good cause. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our brand new app. Download it for free from your app store. This upgraded version features news, public affairs, documentaries, how-tos, and many more programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Mora. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.